Hey guys, welcome to Disenthrall. Today we have a special episode. We're going to be discussing Bitcoin. We have with us... We got uh, Will, who is a Bitcoin enthusiast and one of the uh, leaders of the Dallas Bitcoin meetup. And we have Jeff here, who is an indie game developer. And uh, want to tell us a little bit about your game? Uh, yeah, we're working on a game called Mage. It's a 2D platformer, kind of like the old NES Castlevania games. Uh, but we're kind of doing an HD remix with it and kind of continuing on that path before things went into 3D. Is there a, a website link we can put in the description? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, mecromage.com, M-E-C-R-O-M-A-G-E. Awesome. And we'll also put a link to the, the Dallas Bitcoin meetup on meetup.com. Awesome. All right. Very good. So um, the, what, the, what we wanted to do today was kind of give the introduction to Bitcoin. I know it's been done a, a bunch of times before. Today, we want to give it another shot, see if we can do a better job, really kind of target people that have never heard of Bitcoin, aren't quite sure what it is yet, uh, that would like to understand more, and maybe even find out how to get involved or get into it. So why don't you lead us off, the, the our resident Bitcoin expert here. So uh, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin, it's a decentralized uh, digital currency that you can send uh, pretty much anywhere in the world instantly, just like you would an email. Uh, there's no central clearinghouse, so it's uh, considered peer-to-peer -peer where the only two people involved in the transaction are the sender and the receiver. So can we break down, like, the, the, the initial definition you gave was a digital decentralized currency. Yes. Okay, so digital means there's no tangible backing material for what we're talking about. It only exists on the internet, on people's computers. How would you on describe the that? On the internet. So there's uh, miners, as they're called, all over the world that are kind of like the auditors. And uh, each of these nodes, as they're called, maintains a complete copy of the ledger that shows which accounts have how many Bitcoins. So that account, or that ledger, exists many times over all over the world. So that's where the coins are actually monitored. Okay, so that's the digital part. Then um, decentralized is what you just described, right? So um, no one bank institution or uh, central governing body can control. Right, so Bitcoin has a set of rules and if you follow this set of rules, your copy of the ledger will be current and recognized <clears throat> as correct by the other people participating in it. Um, so in that way, as long as you're following these rules, anyone who has a copy, uh, that copy or the, the ledger is decentralized so that there's no one person. You can't go into one person's house and steal their computer and the records are gone because it exists everywhere by anyone who's following the rules. So the last part of that is currency. What, um, how does this differ from money? Like what is money? What is currency? What is, mm -hmm. um, how is it different from cash? Yeah, so there, a lot of different people have attempted to define what currency is, what money is. Um, to me, basically, anything that can be exchanged for goods or services is money. Um, and in that way, Bitcoin fits that mold. I think Aristotle had four points that made something money. It was scarce, uh, fungible. I can't remember the other What's two. What's fungible? Uh, just meaning that each unit was completely... Um, equivalent to another unit. So it wasn't, if you have $1 here and $1 here, there's never going to be a dollar that's better than the other one. Oh, okay. So my $1 bill is not superior or less in value than your $1 bill yeah. kind of thing. Okay. And what was the other one? After fungible? Scarce. Scarce, fungible, divisible. And I can't remember the fourth. Mm. All right. Cool. Sorry. Um, I have to get that one out. <laughs> so, so uh, as a currency, it's just something that you trade in exchange for something else, right? Yes. Okay. So, like, it could be a chicken. Um, it could be a bar of gold. Yeah. Um, there was a period where I think people got into daffodils and they were trading flowers or something. No, right? Shells. Shells. Yeah. Shells. Shells. So, got yeah. Salt. Yeah. So we have uh, we have Jeff with us today. He's kind of a Bitcoin newbie, and we wanted to have uh, you know actually somebody live be walked through the process, be introduced to it. So if you have any questions at all in any of this, this is kind of your show okay. in a way. So okay. if you want to know something or understand something, um, you know, speak up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we've, so there, we, we kind of understand it's a currency. It can be traded for value, but what gives it value? So that's the first question I want to ask is what's it backed by? And that's something I think we've kind of been trained to 
to question in a currency because we're used to government currency that mm -hmm. they've had to say is backed by something in order to give us confidence in it. Um, so many people assume that the dollar is still backed by gold and actually the dollar is actually backed by nothing right now. Right. Um, so the difference with Bitcoin is the only reason it has value is because people decide it has value, not because uh, a central authority like a government declares it to have value or declares it to be legal tender. So the only thing backing Bitcoin is itself and the confidence uh, that people have in it and that it's listed on exchanges so people can pay whatever they want to. it. So it's just an open market and it's determined by supply and demand. Um, so backed by nothing is what that means is that like I can't take a $10 bill and go to the federal treasury and yeah. get a small amount of gold for my $10 bill. Is that yeah. what that means? It, they'll laugh at you. <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> right, right. You, you can get $10 of government promises. Yeah. We know what that's worth. <laughs> Those are worth a lot. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it's just in the same way, what is gold backed by? Gold's mm. backed by nothing. It's not linked to anything. It's, Ooh, that's um, a good way of looking at it. It's yeah. the mm. same as Bitcoin. It's whatever someone is willing to pay for. What it's, yeah. what, okay, got it. And in the same way, like uh, people will say constantly, like, well, what is this bullshit like? Um, if it's on the internet, then why aren't people just creating all these zeros and ones to create more? And that's what's really what gives it value is the fact that it's scarce and that there's only going to be an, a certain number of Bitcoin created. Exactly. And at some point it will stop. That's really what gives it the value is that there's not an infinite number of Bitcoin. It's yeah, that's the scarcity. Creating. So yeah. there's a, it'll be capped at 21 million Bitcoins will be created. Um, right now, I think there's about 15 million out there. Yeah. And every 10 minutes... Uh, 25 new Bitcoins are released. And just just like the uh, U.S. currency, its um, value is also determined by the confidence in the, in the currency. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, like, of course, confidence in U.S. dollars has gone down over time as the U.S. has gotten more and more into debt. Mm -hmm. um, same thing Absolutely. Happen, would happen to with the Bitcoin. Sure. Yeah. I, I love thinking about it. Like, I, I love what you said about gold. Like, it's the same thing that gives gold value. It's that people have decided that it's worth something, mm -hmm. and, and and that gives it value. That's where the value stems from, right? Is its scarcity and and its demand, right? Sure. And it's ease of use. And yeah, Probably. so so well, it's, there's another bank coming out now. I forgot the name of it. Um, it was on it was on somebody. Uh, it was on that Anarchast. He interviewed mm -hmm. somebody that was running it. Maybe he was running a bank that the point is like you have a bank account, but it's all gold backed. And so when you actually buy and sell with your debit card or something, you're yeah, actually I've seen those before. trading gold or something like that. Mm -hmm. We should try and interview that guy, too. That'd be an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so uh, Bitcoin has value because it's scarce. People want it and therefore um, people pay you know money for it or trade items of other value for it. Sure. would probably be a better way of saying it, right? Exactly. We, we were kind of touching on a couple of questions I had. One of them is about mining Bitcoin, right? Like, I've, I've heard they get mined, and there's a certain point in time where there's a certain number where, oh, they're not going to be mined anymore. It's, right. it's, they're going to stop mining it, and then that'll just all be out there. So there's kind of that, like, how is it mined? Is it, is it worthwhile to mine them still? Um, and then what happens if people lose them? Like, can people lose them? Sure. So mining, uh, mining will go on forever. So right now, the... New coins are released, as I mentioned, until there's 21 million, mm -hmm. but there will still be network fees. So when you send a Bitcoin, there's a small fraction of a dollar. It varies based on some formula, but the miners will still get that. Um, so mining will always be in existence. And miners, um, okay. they're basically just solving very complex mathematical problem. Um, and that the difficulty of that problem is adjusted so that there's one solution found every 10 minutes. So if a lot of people start mining, there's more hashing power brought to the network. Uh, the the problem will automatically get more difficult to slow down the rate at which a solution is found. And the only purpose of that is to really randomize who is in control of that 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So around the world, whoever that one person is that finds the answer is the auditor for that 10 minutes and mm -hmm. writes the next, uh, inserts the transactions for that 10 minutes into the blockchain. The blockchain is the, the record of all transactions. Right. Um, well, so just a smart guy. So we're really jumping into the deep end here. Yeah. But basically what, what happens is, um, can you describe like what a miner is? You said he runs some kind of operation that yeah. inserts things into a blockchain. It's There's a lot of terms we, we haven't really defined yet. Yeah. yeah. So the miner is just, there's a certain uh, hashing algorithm that's part of the blockchain or that's built into Bitcoin. And the miner is just running that problem. And the network says, if you find this very rare number, 
you you win that 10 minute section so so it's like a, it's like a math puzzle that anyone can run on their computer right so yes. it's like I, I could just grab my laptop and and start trying to sure and it's meet. got so it's gotten so competitive you could you could run on your computer but you would in a hundred million years you would never win but you could try right um, so it's gotten very competitive so people are building specialized computers um, to just basically all they're doing is brute forcing this technique trying to run it as many t- cycle it as many times as possible um, as quickly as possible to try to be the one who finds this solution okay uh, so so the ledger is what we keep calling the blockchain right yes. and the leather the ledger is just a, a list of everything that's ever happened with any Bitcoin ever since the very beginning right um, the first block was called the Genesis block and uh, whoever mined that block won at that time I think it was 50 bitcoins. So their account would have 50 Bitcoins. And then from there, they just track. It's just debits and credits. That 50 Bitcoins is transferred to this address. And it just keeps track as a ledger would at a bank. Okay. So the blockchain is a ledger at a bank. Just think of it like a shared ledger that yes. everyone shares. Yeah, that's where the decentralized comes in. Just a decentralized bank. Got it. And all the miners are the ones that kind of sort of is it, could could we say they audit it they or audit that they it, yeah. they ensure it's trustworthy? Yeah, their effort. They so they the point of that is that a certain amount of work has to be completed. So it's just kind of like a challenge so that there's some limit of who could be the auditor. So you have to invest some computing power to try to be that. So that's basically just an obstacle to control who who is the auditor at that time and to randomize it. Okay. All right, cool. Did did that answer everybody's questions? Or yeah, for the most part, I, I'm not sure. Did you touch on um, you know people losing bitcoins, like sure. maybe their computer crashes? Or yeah, I mean that's definitely with the uh, the power of so Bitcoin. Basically, you're your own bank, so mm-hmm. you control the the private keys, which are what unlocks the bitcoins in your account. Mm-hmm. So with that uh, power comes responsibility, and if you lose those keys. There's no way of getting them back. Okay. So there's been a couple interesting cases. Uh, several years ago, some guy was just messing around mining bitcoins early on uh, when it was very easy, and you could just jump on and get a bunch of bitcoins. Mm-hmm. Um, and he realized that several years later that he had been, that he mined bitcoins, mm-hmm. and he realized that his computer was at the local trash dump. Oh no! And he had like oh. millions and millions of dollars uh-huh. worth of bitcoins on there. Uh huh. So he had. I don't know how far he got. He threw out the idea of doing a crowdfunding to try to, you know, raise some money for excavators or whatever. But, mm, wow! But there's a perfect example. If you if you lose those keys, that's that's it. That's it. And so that might be um, a downside to Bitcoin, right? Sure. So if you know, it, it, it's equivalent to gold. If I lose my bar of gold, that it's gone. Mm-hmm. There's no way to like get that back unless I've had it insured. I don't even know if you can insure Bitcoins or not. But um, so if uh, I don't know if somebody maybe steals my debit card for my bank account and spends a bunch of money, my bank will generally insure that and, and replace it. But that, yeah. that isn't the case with Bitcoin? Or are there people that do that? Um, th- I think Aon got into insurance. So there, um, sh- any insurance company, if, if it doesn't exist now, would be willing to enter that market, I'm sure. So that's something to consider. But Bitcoin as the raw entity, yeah, there's no insurance built into it. Um, and you mentioned credit cards. So one advantage of credit cards is when you interact with a vendor online, you have a recourse if they fail, if they end up being fraudulent within X amount of days, you can get your money back. With Bitcoin, it's it's final. And if you, it's just the same as cash. If you hand cash some guy from a, a Craigslist transaction, you don't have a mechanism to go hunt him down very easily. So, um, yeah, that's one downside is the, or you, I won't I call it a downside, something to be aware of. It's different than a credit card transaction. So the decentralized part is probably uh, an advantage um, for multiple reasons. Can we just, can we kind of brainstorm why it being uh, not under the control of a central company mm-hmm. or government is a good thing? Sure. I think a big thing is just censorship. Uh, even the Supreme Court has found that uh, the ability to spend money is, is freedom of speech. Uh, so kind of from an anti-censorship perspective, there's no central clearing house that can decide whether or not your transaction is value or is valid. If you follow the rules, um, if the two people involved in the transaction follow the prescribed rules, your transaction will go through. Uh, we've seen uh, PayPal and other credit card processors uh, censor donations to WikiLeaks. Um, I'm sure there's other examples of 
the clearinghouse deciding which transactions are processed and which not. But so back the when part, like the, so back when the WikiLeaks thing was blowing up, people were trying to donate money to support their effort. Yeah. And credit card processors or PayPal or somebody. Both PayPal and I think Visa. Um, I'm sure they were pressured by certain yeah. people, and they ended up uh, blocking transactions to those accounts. Um, mm. And then they started using Bitcoin. They started the next day. Much saved them. They, yeah. yeah, all their funding came through Bitcoin from yeah. that point on. Yeah, or else they would have failed. Mm-hmm. Is what I heard, I heard from an article. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I really thought it was incredibly difficult to, um, I don't know, obtain Bitcoin up until about, I don't know, nine months ago mm-hmm. uh, when he met and he said, oh, no, it's come along. I met him. Yeah. And he's, he basically said, you know, it's come a long way. You can even buy it in a. Uh, would you call it? a vending machine? You can like yeah. uh, walk up to the machine and put in some cash or something and get Bitcoin. Out. It's gotten a lot easier. The first first I heard about Bitcoin, I was just reading some Austrian economics blogs, and the more I looked at it, I just wanted to get some as fast as I could. But at that time, I had to go to a gas station and buy a MoneyGram, and they bought like a zip mm-hmm. zap credit. And then like five days, somehow some convoluted process, I, I got some Bitcoins. But it was, at my, that time, it was very difficult. Yeah, my first time getting Bitcoin, it was some insane process like that as well. I'm like, you know, and, and there, you know, there's fees, there's layers of fees. Mm-hmm. You got to pay MoneyGram. You got to pay all the intermediaries just to get into Bitcoin. And and not only that, but to do any transactions with MoneyGram or any of those, you're disclosing your identity along sure. the way. And I'm like, well, this isn't anonymous at all. Why am I not just using cash, you know? Um, but now, um, I, I don't want to jump ahead in our conversation, so I'll save kind of anonymity for later. I had something to say about the decentralization. Um, there was a lot of uh, talk about um, the, you know how the, if the banks own all the means of like transferring money around and stuff like that, then uh, and they make you follow all the rules, then they, of course, since they have all the power, they don't have to follow the laws themselves. So. Whenever they get caught for doing some really illegal shit, like <laughs> they, uh, they, 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 you think some legal action is coming their way, but no, that doesn't happen. They, mm-hmm. they don't have to follow the laws themselves. Yeah. So that's that's a real big um, positive of Bitcoin is that yeah, so that it's open happen. source, so yeah. all the rules are on the table, and anyone who wants yeah. to participate, yeah, there. there is no, no there guess, is no, no leader, guesswork. there is no no power in being like. The central authority of Bitcoin because it doesn't exist, mm-hmm. so everybody has to follow the laws of uh, a non-human entity. Yep. Yeah, which is awesome. Mm. So now I want to now I want to like um, like explicitly define what is a Bitcoin. Like, if I own one, what do I actually own? Zeros and ones. You know what 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 am I holding? You know, because to compare it to cash, a cash mm-hmm. I, I pull out a you know I pull out like a dollar bill or whatever and like. Yeah. That's that's the Bitcoin right there. Uh-huh. So where how, where's the Bitcoin? So you own what you actually own is a private key, which is just a key. It's a I forget how many characters say twenty five characters that will unlock the bitcoins from the decentralized ledger. So you own that key that can be used to transfer it from your account to say mine. Uh, and then that will allow you to post a valid transaction to the, that all the miners around the world will evaluate and, uh, and will transfer the money from your account to mine. So let me try making um, an, a word association on that. And you can tell me if I'm if I'm right or wrong or close. So uh, like a Bitcoin, the thing that you would actually hold and store like on your phone or computer or whatever mm-hmm. is like a password. And the password um, unlocks your private little personal access to a piece of sort of the shared bank account yep. that you own, right? So with this password, you can control that little piece of money, so exactly. to speak. And that means you can use that password to send it, to give it to somebody else, to buy something. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you lose that password, you you also have lost access to that little piece of the money. Yes. Okay. All right. So I, ho- I, w- I wanted to try that out. I, th- I was hoping that was accurate. That's it. All right. So the differences then between cash, what what are the, let's like kind of talk about how it differs. Um, so cash, uh, specifically we're talking about the U.S. dollar. Cash is a physical piece of paper that represents a, a promise from the government. Um, it's actually more anonymous than Bitcoin when you transfer a dollar and hand it to someone in person. That's the only information that exists. Um, Bitcoin is considered pseudo-anonymous, where 
it's a public ledger, so every transaction that's ever occurred is known to everybody who uses the network or anyone who cares to look it up. Um, now, who owns those keys isn't by default shared by the Bitcoin code, but someone sniffing your internet connection, if they really wanted to, could maybe see who was controlling those keys, but within the network, they can't. But since there is some way of discovering it, it's not as completely anonymous as cash is. So that's one difference between cash and Bitcoin. Because um, the whole idea is there's a public ledger, there's a publicly kind of shared sort of bank account. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not going to have your name in it. It's just going to have a bunch of codes. So the only way to connect you to those Bitcoins is to connect you to those specific address chains. Which, like the IP addresses? No. So the how, Bitcoin how address is just a long string of numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, the password kind of thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So there's a public and a private key and a key pair. Mm-hmm. Um, the public key is your address, which is what you give to someone if they want to send you a Bitcoin. Um, and that you could post anywhere. You've seen the guy on the news who holds up his sign. Mm-hmm. Hey, mom, send me money. I'm in college or whatever. There's no security loss. Uh, there's a privacy loss in sharing that, but no security loss. So once that guy posted that sign, he was standing behind the news and posted a Bitcoin address. Everyone knows that's linked to him, but no one can steal his Bitcoins because he only posted the public half of that. Mm. He had the private key hidden somewhere. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he can spend out of that, but... I think one question I would have was like, if say that you're you're trying to spend uh, Bitcoin in a retailer, mm-hmm. how can you be assured that they're taking the correct amount of Bitcoin? Um, yeah, so most of them would use some type of portal that you would trust, but you can always uh, just get out your calculator. You can look up. I use an app called Zero Block that shows the current price. Mm-hmm. So if you want to just yeah. do a quick I'm multiplication, so, I'm, I'm guessing that you provide. <laughs> You provide them with your public key so that they can they can charge. No, if you so you're gonna pay. Uh, you want to buy a coffee at a coffee shop yes. with Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So they would provide you with their private key. With their public key. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, with their public key. Thank yeah. you. Um, Money's never taken. Like yeah. in, like in a credit card, it's you give them your credit card it, and right. they take money. Yeah. You always initiate that. Outgoing. That's a good way of looking yeah. at it. Yeah. yeah. So you authorize it on your end. You authorize the transaction, but. Presumably, they would present you with an invoice. Yeah. Yeah. Coffee is point zero zero whatever bitcoins. Yeah. Um, and if you didn't trust them, you could get out your calculator, multiply that number by the current price, which is about four hundred thirteen dollars right now, mm. and you would know how much to charge them in dollars if that's right, gotcha. the currency. So one bitcoin currently today, which is March thirteenth, twenty sixteen, one bitcoin is about four hundred and something dollars. That was on the Coinbase exchange. Yeah. Okay. That's four thirteen. Okay. Cool. Yes. So they give you like. Hey, uh, we're asking for this amount of money sent to this address. Yeah. And, and they would probably present you with the, one QR code that had it embedded in it, their uh, public address. And the amount. And the amount in it. And you would just scan it and do transactions. So a public address, again, I'm, I'm really trying to keep this layman because I think we're all kind of nerdy here. So we could we could probably discuss this at a, high, at a, at a you know, nuts and bolts level. But so a public address would be like if I wanted you to, to wire me money, I would give I would give him my routing number and bank account information. And yes. that would not give him access to take money from my account. It wouldn't just give a him, one way. Just in yeah, he could send that money to that routing number and that bank account number and yeah. I would receive it. And that's kind of a public key, right? Mm-hmm. That's what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, And your private key is like, well, I guess there's more than one, but your pin plus your debit card together or your username and password to the portal of your bank account. Sure. Okay. So um, if let, let's walk through that again, let, like I want to buy coffee. Uh, Ryan wants to sell me coffee. So how would that transaction take place? Would it be slower or faster than like credit cards now? Like um, it's about as fast. I've used Apple Pay. It's, mm-hmm. it's similar to that. You just uh, whip out your phone. The camera just picks up the QR code and the app I use just uses my thumbprint and authorizes it in two seconds. So to buy a cup of coffee, they would show me like a screen with a code on it. Yeah. Like a, like a One Q- of those square QR codes, QR code, barcode type thing. Mm-hmm. And I would just whip out my phone and basically use an app to take a picture of that. And it would say, do you want to spend this money? Yeah. Yes. Done. And then how quickly does that? So that's the thing. The block time I mentioned is about 10 minutes, but for all intents and purposes, um, it just comes up, comes down to how risky of a transaction for a coffee any coffee shop is going to accept it instantly as as done. But, I mean, if you're sending a couple million dollars, you would probably want to wait for a dozen or so cycles of that. 
Um, because it, what happens is it becomes a pending transaction immediately, mm. and the risk is that technically, if you were really sneaky, you could have tr tried to do what's called a double spend. So you could have sent somebody else with a copy of your wallet to the coffee shop next door, and you both could run in and try to buy a coffee at the same second, and then one of those people would ultimately be out of the money because the, what would happen is over time, all these miners around the world would decide who spent it first. Mm. So they would, it's kind of like a a majority rules type thing where uh, only one of those transactions was ultimately. So at first it would accept both of those transactions as pending and then uh -huh. the blockchain would eliminate the one that happened later. Yeah, but it's it's more, it's very complicated and I don't even know exactly how it would decide. So in yeah. theory, like, it might even be the one that was two seconds later. It would just be kind of how it propagated through the internet. Um, wow. But yeah. That's interesting. So that's, that's where the risk comes in. Right. So if you're selling something for a hundred thousand dollars and you're using Bitcoin, you don't, you wouldn't just see it hit the network and run away. Say, see you later. Cause someone could be trying to scam. So, but you, you wouldn't have to know that, that, uh, coffee shops public address, I guess. That's what they uh, give you on that QR code, right? Yeah. To send the money. No, to double spend, you would have oh. to know your private key and, right. and sign two transactions at the same time. Cause you oh. could sign as many transactions. Um, but the only, the one that's ultimately valid is the one that's accepted by the network. Oh, 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 oh,